guys. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, thank you guys for uh, bringing me over. And I'm so excited, as you could probably tell. I can't wait to tell you all about it. For, let me just get a gist like, have you guys heard of experience mapping? Who has heard of experience mapping? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have heard of a customer journey, user journey? Ah, there you go. It's an experience map. <laughs> right, so you know now what experience mapping is. Um, guys, because um, Casper started with an intro and it's my first time in Riga and I was like, okay, I would do polite. So actually I had kicked out these slides because I want to tell you all about the case studies I've brought, but I was like, okay, I'm going to do polite super quickly. So you guys will know me as Martina Mitz by now. See how user friendly I am. Good luck, that underneath is my real name, Martina Ivanova Mitseva Velia. Good luck, spelling or pronouncing it correctly, right? And I did start already last century. I know, makeup, yeah, that's why you don't believe me. And in the beginning of this century, as a self-taught web designer, I should say, and the beginning of this century, I actually started having first small paid clients. Yay, which helped me finance not only my study in Germany, but also my life, pretty much. And I finished the study in 2007, specializing as a clinical psychologist. <laughs> Sounds serious, right? And then I completely burned out. It didn't even take a year to work as a clinical psychologist, and I couldn't tell you one plus one. It was that bad. I had to even go to a hospital. And then I was like, okay, my mom was like, what about web design? And I was like, right, that was my passion. Why did I forget? What happened with web design? And then a few years later, like after finishing my study stuff, I come back to web design. Oh, these guys are coding. And I'm like, I'm code allergic. So I'm maybe I'm not a web designer anymore. But then I started hearing this user center design. And I was like, wait, users, humans, humans, psychology, come to mama. Right? And then it took me a few years till I was like, okay, all this research, all this cool concept stuff that we do, it just stays on that product or service level. And the boss still takes these decisions that don't really make sense. So I actually want to impact with our findings. I want to impact the whole company, the whole business. So since 2014, I started working as a strategist which is a very bad word in Bulgaria, by the way. So all the dirty politicians make strategies, I found out. But hey, I'm a UX strategist. And then, guys, it still took me a few years. So it's kind of my life goes into 10-year cycles, as you see. It still took me a few years to come and actually marry my passion and my profession and start calling myself UX psychologist. Okay, and a quick disclaimer. As you already heard, I'm a Bulgarian. Unlike the British, we can't do that, keep counting. I'm loud, I'm blonde. Guys, tell me if you are somewhere on me, because that's nature, I can't really help it. <laughs> Enough about me. Thank you, Casper, for that. Enough about me, let's go <laughs> to the topic. Uh, you guys probably will know that Simon Sinek circle, and I have actually chosen it for uh, the structure of my talk today. So first, I'm gonna give you a few reasons why we do and should do experience mapping. Then we're gonna look at how do we go about it super quickly. And then we're gonna get to the examples and make it really tangible, hopefully. Sounds like a plan? Cool. Guys, our work very often feels like standing this huge 5,000 pieces jigsaw puzzle and it's like, <gasps> And now without having a glimpse at the front big picture of the puzzle, sometimes it's on the back, well, good luck taking just one piece in isolation and making any sense of it. You might come up with thousand things what this one piece will be. Unless you see it in the whole big picture, you wouldn't see the connections, you wouldn't really make sense out of it. Then guys, if you don't use any sort of digestible way to present your information from research or any other information you have that's valuable for the company, well, you pretty much end up with these countless folders, maybe digital folders, not physical, but like these countless folders with valuable information that guess what? Only the project team knows about. 
And then project team, good research, another project team, good research. They don't talk to each other. No one else in the company knows about that. So all your valuable information that you found out gathers dust somewhere, right? And then what did you expect? Last but not least, I'm going to talk about humans, of course. If you guys don't put in the effort as a business to really get to know the human behind these labels, user, customer, consumer, call it what you want. If we don't put in the effort to really get to know the human behind it, you might catch up feature rities like Word 2001 or 2003, don't point me, pinpoint me on that. But pretty much that disease that I called feature rities is you brag about everything you can do as a company, all your technical capabilities out there, and you forget the user along the way because this is where you can write. Good luck writing, making sense out of it. So you see, feature rit is very bad disease. Stay away from it. Super quick sum up, guys. Of, these are kind of the more obvious reasons. If you don't get any big picture, things in isolation will not make sense. If you don't get visual or in some way, we all are visual animals. By the way, even if visually impaired people have visual representations of what, you, what we are talking about. So, if you don't go the visual way, you end up with like confluence or like endless stuff that no one wants to go through. But it's super valuable information. And last but not least, if you do everything you can as a company, guarantee you're gonna forget who you're doing it for in the first place. Okay? Guys, if you're still not convinced, uh, that's the moment you want to take out your hand, your phones, because now it's the slide for a screenshot coming. If you're still not convinced and you're that numbers person, you're like tangible, you want to see numbers behind it. There was a business analyst here, there you go. Um, or you want to sell all these efforts to your boss or the CEO or whoever, show them that. <laughs> yeah? So, that graph, you know, they love graphs anyway, Venn diagrams, graphs, yeah? But that graph, thankfully, I got it from the Aberdeen group, who, guys, just when I started doing that talk in 2017, they came with the study that they did late 2016. Now, I was like, thank you! Finally, some numbers behind what I've been talking about so many years. And we're not going to go through the full report, guys. You're going to get the link, so check it out. But the Aberdeen Group talked to 211 companies and they separated them, good earning companies, yeah. And they separated them in the companies, the violet graph, who have a customer journey, a sort of an experience map. And guess what? They manage it. They keep it up to date, keep it alive. And then all the other companies in the orange graph who maybe mapped once or came up with the user journey. Ow. Yeah. And you see some of just some of the results I want to point you at, guys. Almost 15% raised in employee engagement. So what happens here? Not only does your most niche employee know how they impact the end user experience, so it gives them reason to work, but also it's an amazing tool when you get new, new employees on board to onboard them onto your very complicated services or products or ecosystems, right? Results in almost 15% more engaged people working for you. Then, guys, the next two I want to point you at is someone here working with budgets in the company, no? Yeah, so you know what these numbers mean. Yeah, eight percent over eight percent return on marketing investment. Guys, marketing bucket is one of the biggest budget buckets in pretty much every company. Eight percent. This is mind blowing. So you, your marketing messaging becomes so effective that you need eight percent less of these guys. Sorry, <laughs> and then. 23% improvement in customer service costs. So your customer support knows how to help the people. The people become more uh, self, um, more self empowered with the self help that you offer. So it results in less customer support costs. And then last but not least, guys, 
through positive mentions, through up and uh, uh, cross sell and all of that, you actually become almost 16% better in your sales cycles. So if that, that doesn't convince you, now is the time to go. Yeah. <laughs> Now, guys, if um, we look at how do we really go about it, um, I'm not going to be able in like 30 minutes to show you all the nitty gritty details. Hence, I recommend you the book from Jim Colback. And I had the privilege to actually work alongside Jim for two years. And this was the guy who made it each in my fingers. So I was a happy designer. And then because of him, I wanted to become a strategist. And actually, thanks to him, I did become a strategist. So guys, highly recommend the book. It's full of examples and it really gives you all the steps up to how to get buying for, from your managers, how to set up the workshop. It really is a Bible. Now, uh, did you, did you get it? Yeah. Okay. So Jim boils it down, guys, pretty much, no matter what mapping method you choose. There are many different mapping methods for experiences. Doesn't matter which one you go with. More or less, we will always have three levels represented on the map. Guess what? Always on top, the user level or the human level, right? Then we have the organizational layer. And then somehow we need a connector layer, so the touch points or the connections or the contact between these two, user and organization, and that's UX, right? The Venn diagram business, user, UX, right? Um, and then guys, when we look at the first layer, right? So what comes here on the user layer? Um, sometimes, most of the cases, we research some, or we have a lot of information about some processes that take place. Yeah. Then I'll go with that one that you see up there, stages, right? So imagine something super simple, generic, like before, during, after. Before people come to us, during they come and use us, after they've used us as a company. But then sometimes it's not about a process. It's more about mindset. We had a nice discussion here while smoking. It's about what mindsets people are in, what motivates them, what goes through their mind, the more soft data. Yeah. Then stages obviously wouldn't work because it's not a process that we can depict like that. Then I use something that I call buckets. Imagine them just as simple containers or categories. Yeah. And I'll show you in a bit what I mean by that. Then underneath comes kind of the tangible stuff. Yeah. Stuff that we see, stuff that we hear people say. So we see what they do. We hear what they say that they do or they think. So all these evidence based thing, the, the hard facts that we can observe, touch, measure. That goes underneath, so actions usually, or really something that we see or they say that uh, they do. Then it starts get interesting because here the risks that Casper mentioned, for example, will come here. These are some pain points and it doesn't matter, is it? For example, I work on the computer and now I need to take a note and write something. That's a workflow break, right? That will come in here. Or is it maybe some concern or some risk that the user expressed? Or maybe they were saying, yeah, it looks great. That will come in here, yeah? So these are more tangible or less tangible, more kind of implicit pain points, all kinds of things that can cause a problem or are already causing a problem. And then, guys, comes my favorite layer, because this is where all the behavioral designers drop off, and this is where the psychologist comes in. It's like all the things that happen in here. So all the remaining thoughts and feelings, by the way, feelings happen here, not here, guys. There's a misconception. It happens here. So everything that happens here, I'm interested in getting that out. And of course, I can't just ask you, oh, I may ask you, how do you feel? But then people get so pissed off because they can't really tell you how they feel sometimes. It's my work to actually figure it out from what they're saying, from what they're doing, from their all cues, as Casper mentioned, body language, face, all of that super important to really know what's behind it. Still don't know it 100%, of course, but you get closer to it. 
Then the next layer, right, that connector layer, we've got the interactions or touch points between these two main players, the humans and the business. And guys, here you can go super flexible depending on what your need is, right, as a business, as a project team, as a program team even sometimes. You can go and say like, okay, do people interact with us on mobile, on desktop? Do they have to maybe do something on desktop? Or maybe they browse on mobile, then they check on desktop, but then they need to confirm on email, right? So you look at all the interactions, all the touch points you've got with the business. But you can also zoom out, depending on what you need, and just say, okay, do people prefer online or offline contact with us? Right? So you can go no matter how granular you need here. And then last but not least, the organizational layer. Again, guys, you're free to do what you need here. And that's the beauty of all these methods, that you're incredibly flexible. So, very often, I use these maps with information that the business already has. I create this one big picture so that we can actually prioritize and not end up like Word, doing everything we can, yeah? But prioritize what, from user's point of view, what does really make sense as a next step? What are we going to commit the next half a year? That's strategy, right? Then, guys, you see also on that super funny depiction that I made here, you can already tell there are gaps of knowledge that we have, right? In this first stage, we are kind of thin on data. Let's go out, research more, come back, feel that big picture. Or you can say, well, maybe here, there is a bit too much risk, too many pain points, so maybe we should tackle that first or stay away from that step if we can, you know? So it really helps you to prioritize, but then also identify where it could get really tricky. Um, and last but not least, I very, very often use it, actually the most common case, to foster ideation. You know, a lot of companies are like, we want to get out of the box. Well, guys, you don't even have the box on the first place. So get that big picture once you know it, then you can get out of it, of course. And guess what? Our brains, guys, work in a way that the moment we hear a problem, our brains are like, I got the solution, I got the solution. Yeah? So great way to foster all these innovative powers that are actually there in a team or in a company. And last but not least, you Casper also mentioned it with OKRs. Guys, you can put all sorts of key performance indicators, KPIs, from your company. All sorts of data that you measure. You can start putting underneath every stage, normalize these numbers, and then you have a number that shows you how well your user experience is doing. And you can measure it. And the business will feel involved, yeah? And you can see how well are we doing as a business from user's point of view from the guys that we get the money from. Okay, now a few examples I want to show you. If you paid attention at Jim's book, then this tree will kind of seem familiar to you. The most popular guys, as we saw as well, customer or user journey, right? But then we also have Something that I use, and that's why I put on the second place, also very, very often a service blueprint. And then I wanted to show you a mental model diagram because it's really different to the other two. And you see, guys, the customer journey really expands that customer user human layer, right? So all the things that I showed you, all these details about the human or the customer or the user, we put in there. Hence, it has a lot of focus on that. The service blueprint does exactly the opposite, yeah? It still starts with the user on top. We are user-centered, so always user on top, but it expands much more the organizational layer. It looks at all the internal processes we have. Who do we need as vendors, as providers, so that we are able to do our work, so that the users can enjoy what we've done on the front stage, kind of as an end user experience, yeah? And I often, guys, use here to explain the service blueprint. I use the metaphor of a theater, 
Yeah? Imagine you go to a theater. Literally, what you look on the front stage, the play that is playing there, is the final product from that theater, the service they offer you, right? But for that to take place, there is so much behind the curtains. Decors moving, lights and all the technical stuff, right? And then before that play was even, or while it was getting in concept, people will need to make a casting for the actors, hire catering, make someone sew the costumes and all of that, right? So even processes outside of the organization. So you see how step by step you can start peeling your organizational layers, kind of your organizational onion and start looking at, okay, what do we do and where do we maybe screw up a little bit? And the last one I told you guys, one of my favorites really, and I took it here to show you, completely different than the previous two. It expands so much on the user layer, and at least in that first stage where you go about exploring mental models, meaning cognitive representations people have of the world and how they function in it, yeah? So when we go about exploring these mental models, really getting to know people, we stay away from solutions. Yeah, so the organizational layer is not here yet. Maybe the one little pinch that I'll take from the organization is they pretty much give me the contexts, which I'm interested in. That's it, but no solutions, no organization yet. Once we have the mental model, then I invite the organization to kind of map themselves and see where we can tap on. Um, and I told you guys, it's so flexible. That's the beauty of it. You can really, out of this all stages, say you've looked at a very granular process or like very general process. And now you take just one before your service stage and you expand that and you put all the nitty gritty steps and you see you have a map from this one stage, right? So you can zoom in or out horizontally, but guess what? Same way you can zoom in or out, or kind of, it's not zooming in or out, but expanding and enriching vertically. So very often I start with the customer journey that has a process in it, but then I'll ask people about a few situations, a few, what they thought there, a few contexts that they were in, looking at metaphors, right, to learn more. Um, or as I showed you on the mental model diagram, we start with one thing and then during the process of work it evolves with a different layer and i see you are already falling asleep <laughs> that's planned i know guys this theoretical stuff i'll fall asleep too so what i couldn't wait to come to i hope i have some time um, is to actually show you examples from my work because i'm really burning for my work we have the best job ever before we guys jump into the examples, I want to give you my rule of thumb pretty much. If you are faced with a lot of information, so there is huge research or analytics, like there is a lot of information already, or you kick off a project with an extensive research effort, so you know you are going to gather a lot of information, go for the journey map, and I use experience and journey map interchangeably as term, but experience maps is the overarching term for all these maps. But I would always go for a customer or user journey when a lot of data is there. When you have a lot of business implicit knowledge, so every department head tells you, oh, we know the user, we know the user already. Hmm, okay, get this knowledge together. So when a lot of stakeholders Go with the service blueprint. That's your friend. You want to unpack the organizational layer and all this implicit knowledge that they have. And last but not least, guys, it's proven very, very helpful in my work. When a client comes and says, we've got this new shit, no one has that out on the market. And it's like, how do you even go about researching that? You can't compare, you can't learn from anyone else. You go about researching mental models, so how do people perceive the world and where can we tap into that? And I know that still sounds a bit like I see the question marks in your eyes. So guys, I've prepared for the first case. I'm going to show you two examples and a half. Yeah. And for each of the other cases, the blueprint and the mental, mental model diagram, I'm going to show you each one, one case study. 
So, um, in February 2020, a business owner comes to me and says, Martina, we've done all this research and we talked to the business users from our solution and they told us what to do and we did it and they still wouldn't use it. And I was like, come to mama. <laughs> yes. And then lockdown happened. Yeah. So beginning of March, two weeks, the whole world was locked down. And this business owner was recruiting business users in the time. So from mid-March, I started two weeks, 10 interviews, actually 12, interview, got 12 interviews, but two of the cases were so outlier, so away from our context that I was like, okay, was interesting learning from them, but we can't really use them in the analysis. And then guys, I took these 10 interviews, right, that were relevant and started consolidating them in a customer journey. And I have here a beautiful time lapse for you. It's Neuro I'm working in, in case you ask yourself. Um, and here you guys see, so after 10 interviews, it kind of all melts together, right? You can't say who said what, who was that, but it melts together. 10 people melt together and that's great. That's exactly what you're looking for actually. So after the 10 interviews, very important, sleep a night over, don't underestimate the power of your subconsciousness to sort information and look for solutions. Sleep a night over, very important. And then I'll get up and super quickly write down what was the common in the story of all these 10 people? How did they come to the context that we are researching? I'll write that story super quickly. Then some attitudes and some goals there. So it's like a persona. Some of you will recognize, but I don't really like persona. So I work with something called user profiles. It looks more at the attitudes and goals they have, right? That's it pretty much. And then guys, I start again from all these 10 people. There are some common things. So on top, I'll have the actions and you see already some yellow post-its. Uh, by the way, the structure that you see the, the gray and black is already given from the interviews I did. I pretty much know what I asked people about and what categories I'll have. And here you see a journey. So we researched some process. And here I asked them about a few other things that were maybe close to our context. So some mindsets. So again, a hybrid between customer journey and mental model diagram. And you see some of the things. So some yellow, some darker pink, and then there are a few, you can't really recognize them, a bit more solid green. These were the things that everybody said. The pale green and the pale pink were already the first and the second interview. And you see guys, interview by interview, I listened to the recordings. I saw some of you already make this one. Yeah, I know, 1,100 over 1,100 post-its. Yeah, it's not done in a day. Of course, that's pretty much a week of work. Then again, very important, sleep a night over before getting to the next step. Because you can't show that to a client, to a customer or a client or a colleague of yours, right? So we started consolidating all of that, making sense out of it between all these people. What is actually the truth? Yeah. And then you see, guys, we end up with a beautiful map, pretty much, that on top has the actions. Here, touch points you see with some images. That was a great tip from Jim because I'm very good at giving advices. Yeah, go more visually, go more visual than me, please. Yeah. Um, so you see the touch points with some images, pain points, thoughts and feelings, as I showed you before. Uh, and here we had some ideas already from, uh, from the users during the interview. So I wanted to mark them down there so we just don't lose them, right? Um, and we took that, guys, I took that, and we had two sessions, so a workshop in two uh, parts. In the first part, I walked them through all of that, the way you see me talking right now, so I was kind of like really storytelling, but also playing it, so I'll be like, oh my gosh, and then I come here, and I don't know where to click. That's the Bulgarian in me, yeah? That pays out at some point. But I did really like infuse empathy, right? We love stories, we love... That makes your colleagues understand how people really feel, getting their shoes. Once we've done that, 
the company was, by the way, that business owner and three developers and one designer. So five people. And I was like, the whole company I wanted. The workshop, of course, five people. Um, and then I let them vote. And I was like, guys, you see all of that here. We walk through. Where do you want to concentrate on? And you see they voted like some area and actually we packed it into a challenge statement. So how might we, before the break, how might we, <laughs> for this business to business users that are so tricky, right? Then we warmed up, generated like all of this was full. Then we started clustering the ideas, started very quickly prioritization and the first session was over. And then we had the second session. So I reminded them again, guys, this is what we did. This is how we arrived at it. This was the person we were doing it for. And by the way, this is what we, what you decided to tackle as next. These were all the winning ideas. We had the one winning cluster. Now let's go on with, with fresh minds, prioritizing these ideas. And that's a simple impact effort scale that you see there. How much is it going to take us to do that? How big the impact is going to be for the user? Super simple, right? And then you see, we voted again, and these were the winner ideas. After prioritizing everything, we talked more about it. So now we knew more about the ideas. So they could vote the ones they see the highest potential in. And then I asked them in the final hour, pretty much or hour and a half, to start and do concept posters. Meaning, take that idea, Tell me how it's going to work for the user. Great. How is it going to work for the company? What are the risks and what do we want to test? And because it was three developers, right? By the end of this session, guys, we not only had a roadmap, as you see here, but we already had a screen from the front end ready for testing, right? So these guys were ready to go test their prototype, their concept, and know what to develop the next day. Pretty much. Guys, it works absolutely the same way when you get into a company that has this huge research team with this huge data. It's again a lot of data. So you go the same way. Happened to me a few, quite a few years back. I joined a company uh, that was actually two competitors merging. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. Um, and then they had a huge, extensive research department. And I was on the B2B users. So I was like, okay, I need to get to know these people first before I design or solve anything for them. Give me data. And the research team was, yeah, Martina, there you go, our repository. <laughs> and there were like six studies just done in the past year. Super relevant. Huge studies with over 20 interviews in depth. So I started reading through these studies and my brain, guys, works pretty much the way mural works. Instead of reading through all of that, having these blink moments and then forgetting them, I started mapping everything for myself on a map just to make sense out of it and see where do we have data, where not. It's my approach as well for, for myself. And then I realized I've just gone through one, two studies. There are four more to go and it's taken me over a week. So I needed to kind of open up that document for collaboration. And then guess what I realized? All my colleagues were coming from here. So no one will see the legend that I had here. And also my map was too small. So I expanded it, fixed quickly my usability issue and invited two of my colleagues, both in the UK in different cities while I was in Bulgaria. And we started going through the studies, one by one. And you see, guys, it's amazing. But no one can go through it, right? Out of 10 bosses, there was one that say, said, Martina, that should go in the Tate Museum. <laughs> and I was like, you're my best buddy. You're the only one who say that, right? We can't torture our colleagues with that. I mean, it looks beautiful for us, guys, for no one else. So we did a super consolidated version of that, as you see just like a quick, yeah, that took us quite a while. Quite a few discussions we had there, right? So here at that stage, guys, that's why on the map I showed you before, it's still important to keep distinct colors 
for all the sources you had. So when you have a discussion, you can go back and see who said that, in what situation they said it. Or as Kasper mentioned, what were they doing while giving that sentiment, right? So we want to identify the sources. We did super consolidate that. The colors were from my colleagues. I, yeah. Uh, but super consolidated version, by the way, with a bit of analytics here on top. So the blue bubbles were a bit of like from a quantitative study we had. And then guys, in one particular stage, in few of the steps, we had, we had quite a lot of information about the competitors here. I hope you can all see it. What are competitors doing good? What are they doing bad? Important information. And then guess what? We took that map and we called the entire product team. We had over 20 product owners. We had product managers, account managers, but also the chief product officer and the chief innovation officer. That was the only guy who said that map should go in the Tate Museum. So of course he was invited. Yeah. And we walked them through that journey. By the way, I usually use on very, very big maps. I will use the actions and touch points to tell a story and then start going in depth stage by stage. In shorter journeys like this, we'll tell everything. Okay. Um, so we walked them through the journey. They understood what our users, customers go through. And then we let them prioritize. Guys, as all these teams, what do you want to concentrate on in the next half an year? And you see, because we had different product teams, no surprise. And I told you guys, pain points. No surprise that all the dots went here, right? They heard pain points. Their brains were already in solution mode. They already knew what they can do. So you see, the majority of dots was kind of here in that stage, the gray uh, bar that we have there. It was all kind of here. But then because different product teams, of course, someone pulled a bit to the side. That was fine. Even these guys could see that the majority is interested in solving that. So great. We did a quick break and then we did surprise ideation session. What can we do to solve these problems or these things that we see here? And then they came up with all these different ideas. Of course, some, like we wouldn't stop people to come out with what they have in their brain. But you see, the majority is kind of here. And then guess what? At the end, we had 10 minutes left. We actually overdid the timing. We had 10, 15 minutes left. And now these product guys started pulling ideas from up there and putting them here on what they want to do as next. Guys, this is an agile roadmap. Yeah, it was happening there in front of our eyes. The whole business was planning their efforts for the next half a year there. Um, we didn't want to lose, though, all this valuable information that we had from research. So what we did for both offices in the UK was to print that consolidated version, but infuse it. This time, guys, this violet is not the ideas from users. It were actual quotes from users. They're actual words, right? So you see how we tried in every stage, if not in every step, to really have the user's words. We printed these walls, you see they were huge, with instructions how to use them. Yeah, we walked through the whole company, we did like hundreds of walkthroughs for all the different departments, but also had here, never read one step in isolation, nor a stage. Look where the user is coming from, look what they're trying to get to, and then look at what you're interested in. These were the two cases, guys, I mentioned, uh, I promised you for the first case. And then that's the half case I wanted to show you. So before there was Miro, I was in New York and my colleagues were like, there you go. And I kid you not, physical folders. There you go. That's the research. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but New York doesn't have Texas on shoes. No way am I going to travel with only one suitcase with that much paper in it, right? So I didn't have Miro, but we all had pay, uh, pain point, PowerPoint. It's a pain point. We all had PowerPoint, yeah? So I actually started, I read through a study. I see all these great things that pop in my brain that that will be 
important, relevant, I started putting it in there, just with like two keywords, two words. And then guys, what we did at the end, because the company was so analytics heavy, I actually got the entire analytics department or two, three guys, main guys from the analytics department. And I was like, guys, let's start look at what do we measure? Step by step, stage by stage, what do we measure? What do we need to measure actually? Because that was the time of big data. Yeah, so they were measuring everything just because we can. I was like, let's look at what we need. The second case, guys, if you remember the rules of thumb, the second case that I mentioned of is when the company has a lot of implicit knowledge. You recognize that very easily in big companies when you see parallel teams doing similar things. That's screaming for a blueprint, right? When you see like they do similar things, no one talks to each other, screams for a blueprint. So get all these bosses together. And I know that's going to take you a while. Like stay warned, it took me a month after I had the buy-in from the uh, VP of e-commerce. She was on board and yet it took me a month to get these guys in a room. And you've got the chief product officer, he's, there is a PO that you can't see, the marketing executive, VP of e-commerce, IT architect, and another PO. Uh, and a junior designer who is assisting me and taking the pictures because it's also a great way to learn, right? And you see, guys, the wall behind me. Oh, by the way, that's me if you didn't. Uh, the wall behind me is just simple, big sheets, sheets with two lines on them, okay? Because I told you, we had that front step. So we have on top user steps. And because it was an e-commerce journey, we actually looked at awareness, right? So you need to become aware of that offering in some way. Then you go about comparing it with what you know already or what you used already or what you expected. Then you go about buying it, taking that decision, and so on and so forth, right? And as I mentioned, it took me a month for these guys to find four hours in their calendars. And then we managed after the four hours, just three and a half steps, kind of. And I was like, ouch, we're gonna need a follow-up session. Guess what? Miraculously, everyone's calendar was free next week. Because they already saw the value in that, right? So they actually cleaned their calendars. And guess what? The week after we had the follow-up session, I was like, oh, wow. In that week, guys, I was like, I want to leave them with something like really clean where they can move around that really works for them. So I started digitizing what we had in Miro. And they walked the week after and said like, oh, Martina, your map is old. Guys, look here at the first stage. They were like, your map is outdated. We already did internal improvements. They optimized the process, the, the business process within a week. Guys that usually in bigger companies, just to get a sign off for something like that takes months. Yeah, so they already did a huge internal change within a week, but not only. And you can tell here we are much more streamlined than here or here, right? So they'll have more work going onward. But what's even more beautiful, they walked in and said, Martina, can we actually on top of every stage note the promises we make to customers and look at how well we fulfill them. And I was like, what? User-centered mindset without me even having to talk about UX and how the impor important the user, they came with that. And I was like, yes. And by the way, the VP of e-commerce got promoted to, uh, no, she was head of e-commerce and got promoted to VP of e-commerce, guys. And the last case I wanted to show you, and it's actually one of my, my favorite, because that's a challenge. A client comes to you and says, oh, we have that amazing idea, right? It's going to disrupt the market because no one has that. And it's like, right. How do you go about learning about something like that? And I told you guys, I go about 
asking people if they've been in similar situations. And then I try to see what was going on there, what they were struggling with, what was going through their mind, or I asked them about a topic. In that case, it was a smart home client. Yeah. Um, and I've already done two projects with them and they were like, Martina, our business partner asked us to do a new product. And I was like, great. And they were like, that's why we need you. A new product for elderly people. And I was like, all right, let's go out and ask the elderly people. And guess what? We found out, forget it. They're going to smash us with all pleasure, but they're never going to let that device walk into their home because it was supposed to be assistive technology for elderly people. And they hate anything that lets them feel, feel old and not capable. So they hated us. And it was like, great, because that's exactly what I wanted. I was sure that's going to be the case, right? And then we realized all these devices that elderly people have, they get them from their grown-up kids. Guess what? Their grown-up kids are our customers, some of them already. Yeah. So we started mapping the mental model of our existing customers plus a few interested customers, right? So new customers, existing customers to not piss anyone off, but also to gain more traction. So you see guys, and that's what I told you, that's the difference to the customer journey, right? So it's not necessarily a process. You see that new thing and now you're like, what is it even? Well, what does it do? So you maybe call your techie friend or you start reading online. So you get familiar with what is it even. Then you see, does it fit me in some way? Might be even before, you already heard of that, so you already look at, does it fit me? Then that new thing comes, you unpack it and it's like it doesn't even have a button. What do I do? Where do I switch it on? Because it's a smart home thing, right? You need to at some point make it work for you, for your special case, customize it, not just figure it out how it works, but also how it works for you, and so on and so forth. And you see guys, I unpacked all of that, by the way, some of you might have heard of jobs to be done. Yeah. These are the items that you see here pretty much. Social without the, so well, you do have the social. So functional, social, emotional job. These are the items that you see in every mindset pretty much. And I was ready with that map and I came back to the company. And I was like, guys, let's look at our touch points. Where do we connect with the user? All of these gray ones that you see at the beginning was that business partner. We didn't have any touch point here with the user. However, where it's blue started to be my client, the company I was working with. And then guys, you see these light gray ones were the ones that they wanted to create and build up. Okay. That was the first kind of the first step. Then we did an ideation came up with all these ideas, right? Techie people, they were like, oh, we can write this algorithm and we can do that. And I was like, oh, yeah, you didn't understand even half of it. And then my project was done. My work was done. And these guys started pulling the ideas one by one, you see here. And guys, these black bubbles are their app screens. So we not only didn't develop any new product, as the business partner wanted, but we actually expanded the app offering that they have. Um, and you see, it's just a snippet from the map. They actually went further looking at the different scenarios, the elderly person, their grown up kid. And then last year, guys, I look at my mural, even before last year, the year before last year in Corona, I sort my murals and I'm like, what is this thing here? And like, I remember the mural being up to here. What is this thing here? Guys, they actually copied the mindset from above and started mapping their marketing strategy. User-centered, me without not even being there for two, three years, they've done it by themselves. I was so proud of them. I was like, they don't need me anymore. They're user-centered without a UX. They're saying about the human all the time. And because that wasn't enough, guys, this summer, all over German media, guess what? A son in London has saved his mom in Munich thanks to our device. So I can't tell you how proud I am and I hope I'll do that right. Pau this. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Martina. I really love the presentation. I'm a junior, so for me, it's a, it's a lot of knowledge and um, uh, information to process. Um, I was curious, like, what would you do after, um, say, you do the um, mapping, you prioritize the issues that you want to focus, uh, and you solve them. So what would be the next step? Do you, are you going to do the mapping from scratch? Look at that. You never end up with issues. Like, Issues are never over, pretty much. So the moment you solve, say, these things here, all the remaining stuff is not gone, right? Or let me show you even a better example. Uh, here, you know, we came up with all these ideas and then we decided to only work or prioritize only a certain part of them. Well, look at that here. It's the backlog. And the backlog never died. Like, this thing never ends, yeah? Make sense? That makes sense. Thank you. Or people also change, you know? So you wouldn't want to change that map every month, every half a year. But now, for example, given Corona, right? Or given the war in Ukraine, that will be things that really shift our mindsets. So it will be interesting now to do a new effort depending on your users if they're impacted and look at what has changed there, what are new pain points arising or have some solved themselves without us even doing anything. Yeah. Uh, did you have a case when it was uh, very difficult to get to the end user? And how did you go around it? That's a great question that I asked myself, by the way, at conferences, because yes, we are uh, in one project. I had this super high-end customers like with Rolexes and all that stuff. And it's like, where do you get these guys? And I asked our people in the business and I was like, get me a few users, like get me four or five, please. Like just to get some feel who I'm working with. And they were like, no, no, we can't piss off these guys. No, no, no. So you know what I did? I bought a day pass for an airport lounge from Lufthansa. And I was like, uh, can I talk to you? Excuse me. And I guess, I don't know why, but all the guys talked to me. They had time. They almost missed their flights. So I got my five user research interviews, like just as a gist, right? It wasn't like a done, done study, but hey, I got my ideas. So yeah, be creative. Always think, where can you find these people? But also, where can you find them when they have time? Because if I ask them at the gate, they would have been like, oh, right? But they were at the lounge. They had nothing to do anyway. And they were like, yes, I'm going to talk to you. They wanted to buy me drinks and stuff. Didn't work out. <laughs> if you said that we can ask you questions after the event, uh, where can we find you? Just give me a second. Come on. There. Actually, so to be honest with you, here I'm a professional, here I'm very political, here I hardly use it, we'll see if it's still gonna leave, and here I haven't figured it out, guys, I'm not, the, I can't do that. So my Instagram is like any other Instagram, I guess. Thank you. But yeah, feel free. Uh, you can also find a few talks on YouTube. Uh, the service blueprint, guys, I recommend this one to you because I actually done an in-depth um, presentation about service blueprint and that case that I told you, but in much more detail. And also kindly you express how, if you know them from Belarus, they wrote a blog post on uh, that entire service blueprint. You'll find it on YouTube. I also talk about behavior analysis, psychology, huh, surprise. Yeah. And all these presentations, by the way, also career guide and uh, CV and portfolio resume guide, call it what you want. So if you are in the process to apply, go here. Because if I haven't done a video, I upload the presentations there, at least. Yeah.